What's up everyone, Mark here and welcome to another episode of Down the Road. Today's topic is one that's near and dear to my heart and the hearts of many, many Rhode Islanders. Today we're talking about the history of Rocky Point Park right here in Warwick. You needn't look any further than right behind me in most of my videos to know that I'm a fan of the park. Rocky Point has an incredibly interesting and storied history of nearly 200 years, during which time this coastline treasure has served in a number of different capacities, but always in a way that takes full advantage of the nature and beauty the land has to offer. Before we get started, I want to take a minute to thank you all so much for watching today's episode. In the end, I hope you learned something, or maybe I spark a memory. Either way, I'd really appreciate it if you'd consider subscribing to my channel. Just click the red button down below the video or the watermark over in the corner, and when you do, make sure to ring the bell so you get a notification every time I release a new video. I work really Really hard to make these videos the best I can make them, and it's nice to know when people really are watching and enjoying them. Views are great, but it's even better when you give the video a like, drop a comment, and subscribe. It shows me that you're genuinely interested and want to see more of what I'm doing. In fact, you can show me that you're paying attention right now by leaving your favorite amusement park ride down in the comments. Did you do it? Okay, so if we go way, way back, in the early 19th century, the Rocky Point land was originally owned by Thomas Stafford Jr. and his wife Polly. But by the 1840s, Sea Captain William Winslow began taking passengers on pleasure cruises to enjoy scenery along the Providence River and the shores of Narragansett Bay. The tours became so popular that he began stopping at Rocky Point, arranging picnics and day outings for passengers. In time, he purchased the land outright and began setting up small amusements there as traffic to and interest in Rocky Point itself grew. As time went on, he built a clam house and a bakehouse to support the increasing number of guests, with his wife Mother Winslow preparing the clam bakes. In 1865, Winslow sold the property to Byron Sprague for $60,000, nearly a million dollars in 2021. Sprague built a 10-floor observatory tower soaring 250 feet above sea level, offering magnificent views in all directions. He added a three-story, 300-room hotel overlooking the boat landing area with its own stables and boathouse, as well as a three-story mansion house to service his private residence. His intention was to turn Rocky Point into an exclusive playground for the rich, with a golf course and other amenities and wealthy patrons ferried in by steamship. By 1870, however, the plan was not working and Sprague had lost a great deal of money trying to make it happen. He ended up selling the land to the steamship company, who reimagined and built up Rocky Point in a departure from Sprague's vision. They made $200,000 in additions to the park, worth more than $3.5 million in today's money, including a shooting gallery, stages for musical acts, trapeze artists, and performing animals. It wasn't long before steamships were churning up and down the bay to bring visitors from all over the country who were attracted to what Rocky Point had to offer. President Rutherford B. Hayes even visited Rocky Point on June 28, 1877, to make remarks and attend a clam bake in his honor with more than 1,500 of his supporters. In a coordinated publicity and marketing stunt during the visit, Hayes was linked by the then cutting edge technology of a landline telephone to Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, who was stationed 13 miles away in Providence. In the first words ever spoken by an American president on a telephone, in response to Bell's greeting, Hayes said, and <laughs> I'm not kidding, Please speak a little more slowly. An entertainment and theater promoter by the name of Randall Augustus Harrington, born in Warwick in 1854, became Rocky Point's manager in the 1880s. Harrington made significant additional investments in rides and amusements, like carousels, water slides, and more. All the while, a relatively new craze was sweeping the nation, baseball. While morality and religion-based blue laws prohibited professional baseball on Sundays virtually everywhere else in the country, Rocky Point staged games in blatant disregard of the law, with pocketed politicians and law enforcement casually looking the other way. After being signed to the Boston Red Sox, Babe Ruth played just two games there during the 1914 season, before being shipped down to the Providence Grays on reserve. Ruth went 8-1 as a pitcher for the Grays, and even famously hit a home run into the ocean at Rocky Point, helping to lead the team to the championship pennant that year. By 1900, the Warwick Railroad had been electrified, and an extended loop added to bring trains right into Rocky Point. With eager guests boarding open-sided trolleys all day long, at some times during the height of the season, cars were leaving Providence every five minutes bound for the park. Harrington died in 1919, and his remaining family had no interest in continuing to run the park. So they sold to new owners who would continue to operate it until the first time it was destroyed by a storm. The 1938 hurricane came with no warning. The technology simply didn't exist, and the storm has no name since storms weren't named back then. 
but it was nonetheless devastating. A Category 3 hurricane by modern standards, made all the more tragic by the lack of forecasting technology, sustained winds of 120 miles an hour scoured the coastal point. In the aftermath, the monkeys from the park's petting zoo got loose and managed to live for a number of years on their own in the natural area surrounding the park, attracting the constant interest and curiosity of park guests. Rocky Point was again destroyed only 16 years later by Hurricane Carol in 1954. Although it came with a warning and was not as severe as the 38 storm, it was still enough to level the park once again. Others floundered in efforts to rehab the park when Vincent Furla and the Furla family began a long tradition of heart and soul dedication to Rocky Point. Vincent brought his brothers Conrad and John over from Italy and had them help him run the park. Conrad would manage the shore dinner hall, while John would manage the park midway. There were doubters while the park was being rebuilt, but the turnout on opening day was so great that cars were backed up main roads for miles into neighboring cities. Rocky Point continued this growth and regional success for decades. By the 1960s, Rocky Point Park was booming again boasting an unimaginably huge second iteration of the world's largest shore dinner hall and a growing number of games and rides. With the addition of the Palladium Ballroom and Windjammer Lounge, the park had capacity for all manner of events and for a time was the only venue large enough for neighboring cities' events and political fundraisers. The park was an extremely popular music venue too, with many rock and top 40 artists of the day performing at one time or another, including the Yardbirds, Janis Joplin, Sly and the Family Stone, REO Speedwagon, ACDC, Thin Lizzy, Blue Oyster Cult, Jane's Addiction, The Ramones, The Red Hot Chili Peppers, Pearl Jam, Sonic Youth, Weird Al Yankovic, Peter Frampton, Lush, Weezer, The Beastie Boys, and their final concert, Roomful of Blues in 1994, to name just a handful. One of the most famous and popular attractions at Rocky Point for many years was the Olympic-sized salt water swimming pool, filled and maintained with filtered seawater. In reality, the pool was always a bit of a loss leader for the park, meaning it cost more to maintain and profit could be made on it. The whole idea being that if the pool brought patrons to the park to ride the rides and eat the eats, plenty of money would be made back that way. And although plenty of visitors were there just for the pool, this model was still successful for a long time. But as the pool aged and fell deeper into disrepair, the prospect of keeping it open grew more and more expensive, and at the same time, less and less worthwhile. Eventually, the decision was made to close the pool in the early 1980s, and although it was soon filled in, the surrounding coping and concrete deck still remain to this day, visible both from the air and the ground. Management always seemed keen to add new and unique features and thrill rides to the park, and over time, changes were made to the layout in order to accommodate new rides. The addition of a log flume in the 1970s introduced a wet ride for the first time in almost 100 years. Rocky Point's famous arch over the southern midway gate was added around this time too, purchased as essentially scrap fixturing left over after the 1964 New York World's Fair. A series of similar arches were used as numbered markers for meeting spots around the outside of a large central pavilion at the fair, and it's believed that it was intended to serve a similar purpose as a landmark for Rocky Point. In 1984, an ambitious new addition to the park was a designed-to-order corkscrew roller coaster from Aerodynamics. One of only a couple of loop corkscrews in existence at the time, it included a 360-degree loop before the helical spiral. Soon after, an intimate freefall was added, this time secondhand from another park, but no less exciting to ride than a new one. Both rides were wildly successful, and the park saw plenty of success before the start of a painful decline. In later years, the park's new ownership, in private equity fashion, began to leverage profits generated by the park to fund other business ventures which were ultimately unsuccessful. All the while, less and less of what was earned was being put back into the park, leading to a slide in quality and upkeep. Ultimately, the park filed for bankruptcy in 1996 after a final season, with an auction to follow where rides and other assets were sold off. Many of the rides continue to operate as of 2021, with the flume having gone to an amusement park in the Philippines, and the corkscrew having gone to a park in Washington State to name just a couple. Like an organ donor, Rocky Point's vital parts may have gone on to breathe continued life into parks all over the country and the world, but this also meant that that life was now gone from Rocky Point. You could think of this as sad, or you could consider that there's truly a little bit of Rocky Point Amusement Park continuing to live on everywhere around us. What followed, though, were nearly two decades of decay and lack of progress, during which time it was becoming clear that Rocky Point was not coming back, at least not like it used to be. The loss of the land to development of yet another cookie-cutter subdivision was narrowly escaped, but then nothing else. All the while, what remained of the park succumbed to a combination of the elements and vandalism. There were buildings, ride foundations, and more, all continuing to slowly rot away. Some buildings burned while others were proactively torn down. There were a number of times over the years that I found my own way in as an urban explorer and photographer, and so I've had a unique first-hand experience of seeing and documenting the disintegration. 
Eventually, the city of Warwick obtained the shoreline land, cleaned it up, and opened an asphalt-paved walking path along the shore in 2011. It was a small stretch of progress with a long, long way to go. Portions of the interior land were bought by the state in stages between 2008 and 2013. With the help of the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management Parks and Recreation Office, the land was fully cleared, graded, and planted before being reopened in its entirety as a state park in 2014. While all of the buildings are gone, a number of features of the former amusement park remain. These include the support tower from the Circle Swing Ride, the famous arch, and the loading platform, stanchions, and turnaround from the Skyliner Aerial Tramway. Although the Circle Swing Ride was abandoned after the 1954 hurricane, its support tower was moved to its current location and remained with a beacon atop until the park closed. The arch, too, remains where it was, and has even been restored with rust removal and a proper paint job, returning to its blue and white color scheme from when the park operated. Some folks have an easier time than others reconciling Rocky Point's past, present, and future. It's easy for nostalgia to get us so caught up in what used to be that we fail to see the beauty in what we have in the present. We're fortunate now to have a new state park that will remain free and open to all who want to come and take advantage of its natural beauty. In a way, it's back to how things were in Captain Winslow's day. In the years since the reopening, the park has been improved with expanded parking, shelter pavilions, restroom facilities, and even a new fishing pier. And just because we appreciate what the park is today doesn't mean we can't continue to remember and appreciate its past. There are still reminders of it everywhere, from the extant landmarks inside the park to the sign at the top of Rocky Point Ave. There are other reminders too. An annual 5K road race courses through and around the park. Area historian George LaCrosse maintains an extremely popular Facebook group dedicated to remembering Rocky Point and partners with others on works of preservation linked to the park. Local filmmaker David Betancourt, having his own memories of Rocky Point growing up, produced the film You Must Be This Tall, the story of Rocky Point Park in 2007. But perhaps most remarkably, Sean McCarthy, a young Warwick man not nearly old enough to have his own first-hand memories of Rocky Point Amusement Park, became fascinated with it at a young age. Over the last several years, he's amassed an impressive personal collection of Rocky Point artifacts and memorabilia. He's also single-handedly led the restoration of a number of the original items, including cars which remain from the Castle of Terror, aka the House of Horrors. McCarthy has produced a number of unique limited edition pieces related to the park, including a set of pins featuring the monsters of the Castle of Terror. And in 2019, a group of collections, including his, were brought together and shown collectively for the first time in an exhibition at the Warwick Center for the Arts. Today, the new state park and pier are thriving, and in the summer months, there are all sorts of events from pop-up movie nights on a giant inflatable screen, to food truck festivals featuring some of the area's best established and up-and-coming culinary cruisers. Now more than ever, we need to cherish our old memories of Rocky Point while continuing to make new ones. Guys, thank you so much for watching today's video. I really hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please give it a thumbs up and tell me what you think down in the comments. If you didn't, then give it a thumbs down and still tell me what you think down in the comments. In fact, whoever you are, if you have memories of Rocky Point or a similar park that meant a lot to you, then tell me about it down in the comments. I'd love to hear what you have to say. If you're interested in finding out more about Rocky Point, I've got a number of links to my previous videos and shorts on the subject down in the description, as well as links to the various references and sources used in the research for this episode. One last time, please consider subscribing to the the channel if you haven't already. And most of all, keep watching because all of your support means the world to me. Don't forget that remembering and retelling Rhode Island history is important because Rhode Island history is our history. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.